So let me see if I can explain this correctly without causing a massive chaos in the SCP community in my comments. SCP-217, because somebody had a mental breakdown about me saying 610, is an interesting prospect of disease as it doesn't rob the host of their life, but instead converts them into inorganic material that's actually made out of organic material. Pretty confusing, right? Well, considering this method of delivery stated, the host may be infected with a certain variant of disease that perhaps hasn't been fully yet understood. With that complete Completely confusing intro concluded, let's discuss just exactly what happens to a person that is infected with SCP-217 and discuss this disease itself. First and foremost, what is SCP-217? SCP-217 is a catastrophically communicable disease, the likes of which completely beats out most diseases on Earth. With a devastating 100% infection rate, no immunities or resistance are currently known in the human population, whether it be by genetic lottery or vaccines. 217 is considered to be a virus by standard observations, but being a microbiologist myself who's worked in the lab with actual real organisms, I would say perhaps there's a little more to that statement than just a simple virus, but we will get to that momentarily. When SCP-217 initially enters a host, it's actually fairly benign and typically a person may not know anything is happening as they feel completely lucid. The issue is the incubation period of this disease appears to take years before symptoms begin to show. A person will walk around like you or I, interact with others, visit other parts of the world, and continue to be social over these years. Because of this, the infection rate that this disease possesses, it has been given the designation as Keter Object Class. It essentially has the ability to be an absolute world ender for the human race and virtually every animal on it. Anyhow, after the host begins to show symptoms, they must be immediately contained as presumably they become even more contagious to others after presenting symptoms on their skin, which takes place after the internal structures have been fully converted. Any who have been in contact with a host must be immediately contained for safety of those around them. Chemical sterilization is mandatory for all those that interact or are in the presence of those with this disease. So how does 217 affect the body of those infected? Well, to quote the findings, SCP-217 alters the biochemistry of organic tissue, causing organic matter to rearrange in a form of organic metal. The process involved with these changes are not yet fully understood, but the advanced stages are well documented. A subject will begin to turn into a complex arrangement of gears and clockwork, these taking over the former biological functions. Advanced stage infection is reported to be very painful, but earlier stages are oftentimes unnoticed, with only a vague feeling of confusion, insomnia, and joint stiffness. Parts are replaced by gears and small tubes, joints by gear networks, eyes by structures not unlike primitive hand crank film cameras, and any other portion of the body you can think of still maintains its senses but is replaced by machinery. One of the interesting things about this particular disease is while it will affect every animal it comes across, regardless of species, genus, kingdom, whatever, it still has a 100% effective rate at infection. However, in all other animals except mammals, it appears to affect the skins and exterior structures first. Only the mammals does it convert the internal structures and then work its way out from there. This may suggest that warmer temperatures are preferred for the disease to begin the process of restructuring the body on a cellular basis. But what sort of changes would a host expect upon being infected? Initially in the early stages of the disease, as stated previously, no major symptoms really exist apart from increased lethargy and general lack of emotional responses to events. Lethargy can be explained as presumably your body's immune system would be activated upon detecting foreign materials, which would actually put your body into the rest mode to fight off the invader. However, considering what it does to the body, the lack of emotional responses can be as simple as neurons and the communication methods across synapses being converted or completely degraded, causing hormones like dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin to no longer be released in the brain. Through this process, a person would become more and more emotionless. With progression of the disease, more audible and physical changes begin to take place underneath the skin. Subjects have reported a constant ticking noise that, depending on infection area, may become more noticeable. Specifically, if the infection begins in the shoulders, neck, or head of the host, it can clearly be heard by that person, but what might be considered strange, at least in this aspect, is when recording equipment is pressed against the area, no noise can be found. From a biological perspective though, this is not all that strange. Take tinnitus for instance. It's a very real noise, yet no sound is actually produced. In fact, I have tinnitus, and it is super freaking annoying. Nothing but loud ease everywhere. Anyways, it's simply a lack of nerves reporting to the brain, so in the absence, the brain interprets it as noise. A similar idea can be a applied to the infection. As nerves are destroyed, perhaps the brain may begin to interpret this as noise or ticking. Anyhow, further along the disease's timeline, pain will appear and will increase in amounts, peaking and then dropping off. This sharp pain will almost feel like tearing in these areas as they are being converted into this material. Some have likened it to a knife wound or a muscle tear and it may last from hours to several days. Interestingly, it appears to vary from subject to subject and also location, which again seems dependent upon the amount of material to convert. As the organs become more clockwork 
alert and gear oriented, it will integrate and settle into the tissue. When this happens, upon its completion, the pain will subside and that organ will be forever lost in structure, but strangely enough, not concerning its genetics. The body post-conversion shows many different changes and presents different materials usually found in machinery. The bulk of this material actually is metal, such as brass, steel, and iron. Still though, other substances such as leather, rubber, glass, wood, and basic materials are found in smaller quantities throughout the body. But even though it looks like industrial materials, all still carry the subject's original DNA. So the cells are still there in their normal capacity, but also they've changed. So how is this actually even possible? A cell changing to this capacity would destroy everything in it. So first, let's establish a ground level to work off of. The cells are still cells. They have to be. They are not destroyed, as this would have ruined the DNA, but instead are changed to some capacity. Internally, the cellular structures continue to operate. So what's changed? I believe it is the cell's membrane that is most heavily affected by these changes. The virus to me does not appear to be a virus in a conventional sense, obviously, but instead is probably not that far outside the realm of bioengineered virus presenting possible nanomaterials. Take a look at the virus. Now take a look at like say a nanite. Geometrically, there are a lot of similarities. Viruses are essentially just nature's version of nanites, or in reality, nanites are just humans copying what nature has already produced. I set this up because for us to figure out what it is, we must actually learn what a virus does. So let's get to that science, bro. The SparkNotes version of viruses is that they attach to certain cellular markers on a cell, inject their RNA in the cell, reverse transcriptase reads the RNA, and essentially tells the cell to begin building more viruses, causing the cell to eventually burst and release more viral particles into the surrounding cellular space and continue the infection. The cell's bursting is the main issue. Viruses can alter human DNA to a certain extent, but it's not typical to find them altering the cell and keeping it alive. So is it a natural virus? More than likely not. Could it be something that follows a virus path to around 80%? Absolutely, in my opinion. We will still refer to it as a virus, but let's take a look at what it does. Upon a human being infected with 217, it becomes clear that it will begin seeking out cells almost immediately to infect. It will latch onto these cells, inject material either containing instructions on what to build, which will be read by reverse transcriptase, or even a catalyst that starts a chain reaction within the cell. Either way, this will cause a cell to begin perhaps making materials it might not usually make. Now we sort of get to the realm of Stranger Things. While the body is capable of producing soft metals, inorganic metals are not usually something that we would make. Albeit there is iron in the blood, it's not really in enough quantities to actually be usable for this application. So to me, I believe it would be a catalyst starting a chemical reaction that then amasses in the cellular membrane of the cell. This would give the cell metallic properties without killing it outright. I personally believe that the cells are still alive and functional for a multitude of reasons, but the main one being that the host is still alive and the body is actively undergoing mitosis should the person be injured. In the foundation's findings, areas damaged repair over time, but is much slower than standard human regeneration times. However, what is most bizarre about this infection is after the body begins to exhibit gears and clockwork, damaged areas can be instantly repaired by placing the damaged areas with new parts of the same type. Testing has shown that there are no ill effects if the parts made from normal materials such as steel, wood, or leather replace the existing biomechanical clockworks. These gears in the body appear to link up correctly as well, indicating that the cells are moving and adhering to where they are supposed to be located. This would require information from the virus inspiring cellular locomotion from that area to where they currently are now. While not impossible, this method is currently unknown why the cells would be compelled to move out of their current areas to form structures such as gears and tubes. As the virus begins to work its way through your meat suit and then turn it into a metal suit, there are several things that happen, but one of the more interesting aspects is what happens in the mind of a person. In a literal sense, their mind is still there and they are still present to some degree. However, mental ability begins to wane. Early, the person is still functional, social, higher thinking, and maintains their ability to problem solve, much like their pre-infection stage. This is to be expected as the brain still has high plasticity. In case you're interested, brain plasticity is arguably why organic creatures are able to think and learn. We have new neural connections making all the time, which allows us to problem solve, store information, basically run the brain. In fact, what I've always found cool to think about, when you have a habit of doing something, it's no more than just the same group of neurons firing in the same pattern over and over again. This strengthens the neural pathways, which is why it's so hard to break habits such as biting nails or eating late at night, because your brain prefers to use those pathways. Breaking a habit requires the formation of new pathways, which can be quite difficult sometimes. This also explains what we see in the later stages of this infection. A person approaching a late stage SCP-217 infection, again, has their mental capacity greatly reduced. Subjects respond in repetitive fashions to questions asked, which appears to be a snapshot of the mind at that particular point in time. Their actions are dull and mechanical, and they become easily distracted or confused. Plasticity of the mind appears to have been lost entirely 
entirely as they become irritable when faced with new problems. This is to be expected judging by the other cells we see in the body. With their mitosis severely inhibited, these cells were already almost complete chaos compared to our brain cells. So take something with the staying power of a neuron and put more restrictions on it, the brain has almost completely stopped moving at this point. No new connections will be formed, leading to a greater understanding of anything, and instead, we leave a person severely mentally degraded. Also, if the body is anything to go off of, the mind at this point would be nothing but a collection of gears and tubes. So while the cells still communicate to those directly near them, it may be difficult for the neurons to communicate or have a longer range like they used to have. As such, it's really a miracle that these infected can speak at all. SCP-217 takes the ordered chaos of a human body, which we still have so much to learn about how all of our circuitry works anyways, and instead imposes direct order. Unfortunately for those infected, it appears that the chaos of our minds and bodies is what gives us our humanity, and with that conquered and arranged like a machine, the person loses their personality and ability to think in any great capacity. So, in a sense, they become nothing more than a machine. In summation, I believe that the virus is more than just a standard virus. There must be more to it as it seems to have a deliberate intention of altering cells and changing the body beyond just replication of the virus. Therefore, it is Keter class as it has the potential to cause an extinction event on this planet far worse than anything we've ever seen. Interestingly, I wonder how it would fare against 610. But that is a topic for another day. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope everyone enjoyed my video discussing the biology and consequences of being infected with SCP-217. If you enjoyed, leaving a like helps the video, and if you are new, subbing is a great way to stay up to date on my videos as occasionally YouTube will remind you that yes, this channel does indeed exist. With that absolute shade thrown, I will drop my Twitter, Discord, merchandise site, and Patreon link in the description if anybody is interested in that, and I'd like to thank a few of my patrons. Huge shout out to It's Not a Spoon and Joseph Gibbons for their patronage, as well as Artin Chornage, The Lone Titan, and Freedom Units. Thank you guys, and for the rest of my patrons, I thank you as well. You guys are total ballers and are cool in my book. Okay, so that does it for me. Thanks for watching, and I will see y'all in the next one.